This lecture in Climate and Earth 401 is on the basic structure of Earth's atmosphere. This first figure is a photograph of the Earth from space. And in this, you see the blue of the oceans, you see the green and the brown of the continents, in this case, North America is focused in the center. But you also see a number of other characteristics of our weather and climate. The white that you see up here, this is ice. But this white here, these are clouds. And you can see that these clouds down here in the tropics have a little bit of a different character than the ones in the middle latitudes and the ones up towards the pole. Namely, the ones in the middle latitudes show these effects of the Earth's rotation. They show this turning. And you can also see a difference between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere and perhaps what we would might call the difference between summer and winter. So what is the atmosphere? The atmosphere is a gaseous envelope gravitationally bound to a celestial body, for example, a planet, a satellite, or a star. And that's from the AMS, the American Meteorological Society Glossary, which is a reference that I would recommend you use regularly to define terms that you may not understand. The atmosphere is composed of air, which is a mixture of gases, primarily nitrogen and oxygen, and it has water and carbon dioxide, as well as argon and then a lot of other trace gases, some of which are made by humans. It's treated as an ideal gas, and below 100 kilometers, which is the altitude that we will consider the edge of the atmosphere, it behaves like a fluid, a well-mixed fluid, and it behaves like a continuum, which is the idea that there are really no gaps in the atmosphere. There are no holes. It's a continuous field of this fluid, which is air. So what shapes our weather and climate? What really drives everything is heating by the sun of the earth. And what's crucially important to our climate and to our weather is the tilt of the earth. And that's demonstrated here in this picture from the National Geographic. And here's the sun. And here is the summer in the northern hemisphere and winter in the southern hemisphere. So here's the northern hemisphere. Here's the southern hemisphere. You'll see that this pole, which is the axis around which the earth rotates, is lit in the summer and it's dark in the winter. And then you see six months later the other condition where it's winter in the northern hemisphere and it's dark at the pole and it's light at the pole in the southern hemisphere. So the pole here is along this dashed axis and that's the axis around which the planet is rotating. In the spring and fall, the transitional seasons, then it's pretty much aligned such that day and night are, are equal for a brief amount of time. But this is very important because you'll see there's more heating here at the equatorial regions and that the heating at the polar regions changes vastly between winter and summer, which sets up this idea of differential heating, differential energy source, which of course leads to the condition where we have temperature gradients. And what the weather is, is the need to, of the fluid to smooth out those temperature gradients. What other things shape our weather and climate? The rotation of the Earth. The rotation of the Earth, the fact that the planet is spinning and causing the circulation of the atmosphere relative to the surface to appear to be always turning is absolutely central and critical to the way our weather and our climate works. Also critical is the geography of the earth, the location of the land, the location of the water, and where the mountain ranges are. This suggests that what the Earth is made of is also very important to the weather and climate because there's the ability to store heat. The land and the oceans 
store heat have the ability for heat capacity that's very different. The ability to transport heat. The air and of course the oceans, again the water as fluids, transport heat. Then there's the structure of the atmosphere that is associated with the ability of the different constituents of the atmosphere to absorb and emit radiative energy. An important examples of this for weather and climate are water and ozone and really thinking of climate of course carbon dioxide. And then there's the very important ability of some of the constituents and especially water to be able to change phase because phase changes are really energy changes. Water, which can exist in ice, the solid phase, or a liquid, water, can also exist as water vapor. So each time it changes from gas to, to liquid, or from gas to solid, or from liquid to solid, and back and forth from solid to liquid, it's either taking up or releasing energy. This idea of phase change is crucially important to our weather, our climate, and the stability of our climate. You could think of our climate at some level being measured by how much of this water is present in the solid phase, that is ice. If we look at the atmosphere a little bit more closely in this figure of the Earth's system, which is focused on the atmosphere, the atmosphere has a number of layers. The troposphere, the stratosphere, and the mesosphere are the layers that we would call the well-mixed fluid, the well-mixed air, and that is what we will be considering in this course. And our real focus in meteorology here is going to be on the troposphere. But if you look more broadly, going up here, we get to the thermosphere and the exosphere. There's still some atmosphere out here. Its density is low. The interactions with the sun is more direct. And you move from a place from rather than being a well-mixed fluid, the fluid is stratified by the density of the molecules of the mixture of gases that make up the air. The Earth's system also must consider the land, the biosphere, and the cryosphere, and of course the, the oceans. The biosphere is the life that exists in the land and the ocean. From the perspective of the climate, the biosphere represents storage and exchanges of energy. Up here, in addition to the molecules starting to stratify by their molecular weight, because of the strong effects of the solar radiation, this is becoming a plasma. Then, of course, there are other planets out here which have atmospheres whose basic physics are very much the same as on Earth. This course will allow you to also enter into the atmospheres of other planets. Some specific characteristics of the Earth that I think are important is that the well-mixed atmosphere has a depth of about 100 kilometers, and that is what we will call the typical scale length of the depth of the atmosphere. The ocean is about 71% of the Earth's surface. And then the other thing I will point out is that there are mountains. And the mountains deflect the circulation, which then cause these waves to form. So mountains are integral in many ways to the characteristics of the weather and the climate of the planet. An important number here is the radius of the Earth, which is about 6,370 kilometers, compared to the depth of the atmosphere, about 100 kilometers, and the height of the mountains, about 5 kilometers. If we look at the weather and climate, some important characteristics of the Earth still are the contrast of temperature between the ocean and the land, which you can imagine again being a source of some sort of wave motion, and of course, as I said previously, the location of the mountain ranges. Because of these two characteristics, 
I like to say that the weather and the climate are really organized. They're not random. Things don't just happen randomly in the atmosphere and in our weather. They're, they're really quite well organized by these different characteristics of geography and the rotation of the Earth and the differential heating of the Earth. If we were to look at the vertical structure of the atmosphere, which I've represented here as a function of temperature along this axis, along the x-axis, which is in two units, degrees centigrade and degrees Fahrenheit. In the United States, we're often used to degrees Fahrenheit, but scientists and scientifically, we will rely on degrees centigrade. And along this axis is height or altitude, which is actually presented in three units. This is presented in kilometers, which we might call the standard unit that, of height that we should use, kilometers or meters. This altitude over here is in miles. And again, if you're in aviation meteorology, you're going to use miles or feet, perhaps. And then this axis here is pressure, indicating that to a good approximation, the atmosphere is often in what we would call hydrostatic balance, and hence pressure becomes a reasonable measure of the altitude at which you are observing or studying. Again, the tropospheric depth here, this part down here, is about 10 kilometers or 10 to the fourth meters. The ratio of the depth of the troposphere to the Earth radius is about 1.6 times 10 to the minus 3. And the ratio of the depth of the troposphere to a mountain is about 2. And what you see from that is that the troposphere, and really the atmosphere, is really thin relative to the radius of the Earth. And we will use this approximation of being a thin fluid, which will not have much consequence to our studying weather, but if we were to be studying space weather and starting to look at phenomena, say, well above 100 kilometers, then we would have to relax that assumption. And mountains extend about halfway through the troposphere. Therefore, we can say that mountains are not small and negligible relative to the depth of the troposphere. If we return to this idea of these units here, these units of pressure, pressure is essentially the weight of the air above you. And we measured pressure in meteorology. Traditionally, it was measured as millibars. And over the course of the last few years, in terms of standardization of units, it's usually measured as, and correctly stated, as hectopascals. But many meteorologists, old and young, tend to still call it millibars. And they are equal. A millibar and the hectopascals are, you know, essentially the same unit. The depth of the troposphere is 900 hectopascals out of about 1,000 total. And hence, most of the mass, 90% of the mass of the atmosphere is in the troposphere. So getting towards the end of this description, the atmosphere and the ocean are fluids. To be clear, a fluid is matter. So it's a state of matter like solids and gases and liquids, which is what we learned in f early in our lives generally. It's matter that do forms and moves in the presence of an external force. Some physics books say it's matter that can flow. Fluids can be liquid or they can be gas. So that's why that statement of matter comes in three states, solid, liquid, and gas, is not especially accurate when we're talking about fluids because either liquid or gases can be fluid. So you can't say fluid is a liquid. Within a fluid, dynamic features form that have characteristic spatial scales. That is, they're a certain size. How big are they? And they have characteristic time scales. How fast do they move and how long do they last? Fluids move 
to balance imbalances in heating. They try to move hot to cold and smooth out temperature differences, essentially. Once we have a temperature difference, um, we almost inevitably get some sort of motion in a fluid that then deforms to try to, to get rid of that temperature difference. And persistent places and times of heating and cooling keep the atmosphere and oceans moving because we have the sun being persistent in heating the equatorial regions and we have this variability of the heating of the polar regions. We always have this idea of forcing the atmosphere into some sort of circulation whose goal is to smooth out the temperature gradients that are caused by that differential heating. And that is the end of this introduction to the basic structure of the atmosphere.